my previous video, I addressed problems with the plot of Prometheus, but there are numerous other problems that remain unaddressed by the time the credits roll. In this section, I want to address the problem with the film's characterization. There have been other videos that examine the problem of poor characterization, like Dr. Shaw and Meredith Vickers only being able to run in straight lines from falling objects, or a wildly inconsistent geologist sticking his face into a cobra penis. How much you think that's female? Yeah, she's a lady, look! This video exists beyond simply pointing out that these characters behave like idiots despite being billed as scientists, because maybe scientists in Ridley Scott's fictional future are all idiots. Is that tobacco? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> tobacco. <laughs> Even provided we write all the characters off as idiots, the script and the plot of Prometheus fails to adequately develop the characters. It introduces its major characters sufficiently enough, skillfully shifting gears to devote enough time to render Shaw, Vickers, and David, especially before the rising action. Miss Vickers would like to have a quick word before the adventure begins. <laughs> In fact, let's look at one of these scenes in more detail. There's a man sitting with you today. His name is David. And he is the closest thing to a son I will ever have. Unfortunately, he is he's not human. He will never grow old. And he will never die. And yet he is unable to appreciate these remarkable gifts. Or well, that would require the one thing that David will never have. A soul. I have spent my entire lifetime contemplating the questions where do we come from what is our purpose what happens when we die and i have finally found two people who have convinced me they're on the verge of answering them doctors holloway and shaw if you would please stand as far as you're concerned they're both in charge the problem is that after the second act, when all hell is breaking loose on the planet, the film abandons these characters in favor of driving the plot forward, when a stronger script could have managed both, as I will demonstrate in this video. Scott and his judicious editor acknowledge in the supplements that they felt compelled to rush through the final act, lest they break the audience's attention, but they do far greater damage by leaving plots unresolved. To be clear, these moments towards the end are not plot holes. A plot hole suggests the narrative thread is nonetheless finished and that there are gaps in the structure. The problem with this film are altogether more egregious, for plots are introduced which never reach any satisfying conclusion. This extends beyond merely Shaw's continuing adventures and has absolutely nothing to do with the many unanswered questions of Prometheus. Instead, the problems addressed in this video revolve around the various unresolved character strands in the movie. Beyond representing plot failings, they also typify poor characterization. That multiple characters in this film have different motivations is not necessarily a problem, however. Indeed, it can allow for dynamic storytelling, particularly when one character's motivations comes in conflict with another. What did you say, David? I don't think you'd want me to tell you. Prometheus gives us a scientist looking to communicate with extraterrestrials, another scientist searching for proof of God, an aging tycoon who wants more life, a robot who wants to be free of humanity, a woman with unclear goals except to possibly prove she's not an android by having sex with the captain the first chance he's given. My room. Ten minutes. And a crew of miscast idiots who have no reason being on board. Ooh. The problem is that Prometheus squanders these potentially interesting drives by doing absolutely nothing with them. Holloway dies before he has a chance to meet his maker, so to speak. Shaw is no closer to finding God than simply believing she will. But it's what I choose to believe. Which, coming from a scientist, is especially ludicrous. Wayland is resurrected from cryostasis only to be killed off within a matter of wasted minutes. The only thing David gets liberated from is his body. Thicker seems to exist only to get the lifeboat onto the planet server so that Shaw can fight the engineer inside it. And the crew, meanwhile, exists only to prove the severity of the situation and the film dispatches with them in the editing room before we even get to see them killed off. Rather than adequately addressing any of these goals, the film simply complicates the narrative by layering problems. Big things have small beginnings. Rather than dealing with the consequences of Shaw's cesarean, namely, is Shaw angry that David tried to freeze her rather than remove the embryo as she demanded? Are the crew upset that she attacked them, escaped, and unleashed an angry squid baby in the med pod? Is David upset that Shaw didn't allow him to capture the embryo? After all, why infect Holloway in the first place if he wasn't concerned with the various life cycles the infection would take on? 
and more importantly, just what are they going to do with that alien squid in the next room? The film instead tacks on a needless twist, Wayland. Furthermore, what's his reaction to Shaw's abortion? The fact that it's never mentioned again is a staggering lapse in logic. Granted, none of these questions are plot holes so much as they are missed and wasted opportunities. Before the film has time to deal with all the complications it has developed up to this moment, Fifield shows up at the front door of the ship to provide the film with a needlessly gory fight scene that grinds the movie to a noisy halt. Musicals died of screaming death in the 1960s because audiences grew tired of sitting through musical numbers that went nowhere. But for some reason, action films are free from the same narrative criticism. Not only does Fifield's attack have no bearing on the events, its conclusion instead only once again reveals the hasty stitches of the film's careless editing. The scene's original cut, so we're told by the editor, begins with Shaw, Whalen, and David attempting to leave the ship to visit the engineer, which more plausibly explains why anyone would open a door on a clearly hostile alien planet when a missing crew member inexplicably appears outside a curl up like a terrifying yogi. In the finished film, however, there's no plausible reason to open the door, at least not right away. Does anyone on this ship think before they act? Perhaps the film is hoping to be too busy wondering about that to notice the scene's nonsensical ending. Byfield kills countless collateral crew members and is then crushed under the wheels of the shuttle that speeds off into the distance and is never mentioned nor seen from again. So, wait, who was in that shuttle? Wait, where did they go? Why would they not return to the ship? Not that there's even time to wonder about this shuttle or its missing crew, since the film speeds along to the next complication. We still don't know how Holloway got infected. If it's in the air. It's not. How do you know that? Well, it's David's thinly veiled admission to Shaw that he's responsible for Holloway's infection and Shaw. her impregnation. Please. Squandering what would normally make for compelling drama, the scene trades in any sort of development of Shaw's reaction to the knowledge that David essentially ruined her life to focus on awakening the engineer. The film provides a suggestion of a compelling conflict to develop between Shaw and David with this revelation, but does nothing with it. Even after Shaw defeats the engineer, she never confronts David about Holloway's murder, other than a cryptic admonition at the film's end. Why the hell would I help you? Because without me, you'll never leave this place. While the film's multiple plot themes do not require that Shaw react to David's obscure confession, Shaw's near total non-reaction makes for some weak characterization. Holloway and Shaw are supposed to be in love, but she's not even in the least bit angered when she discovers that David orchestrated Holloway's death. These lapses in intelligence make the character so stupid and implausible as to be unworthy of emotional attachment from an audience. Shaw ceases to be a human being and instead functions as a mere pawn in a lazily sketched plot. Rather than introduce this moment then, Scott would have been well served to omit it. If he'd done that, then Shaw could have learned about David's treachery in the sequel, and the sequel could have developed that into a compelling source of conflict for the pair. Instead, this film complicates what is already a complicated plot. The filmmakers were looking for material to cut, rather than taking bits from each subplot. They should have jettisoned extraneous subplots completely. For example, they could have left more time for another scene had they jettisoned the entirely superfluous Vickers and Yannick subplot. How much longer is this going to take? It adds little to the film, and in fact destroys one of the more intriguing possibilities of Vickers' character. The suggestion that she might be an android, a sort of bionic sister to David, and Wayland's unholy offspring, is entirely abandoned in favor of a stilted and immediately abandoned romantic entanglement between Vickers and Yannick. What do we get from their brief tryst? My room. Ten minutes. What comes of their union? What is the impact on the plot of their relationship? Absolutely nothing. What is the film trying to say by having these two characters have sex? Ironically, if they'd showed them having sex, perhaps copulating robotically and mechanically, it might have been an interesting and ironic juxtaposition to the violent and fluid oral rape of the engineer, the film's one and only sex scene. The antithetical scenes of Yannick and Vickers and the engineer and the trilobite would have allowed Scott to make some pointed observations about late 21st century human behavior. Perhaps that it's becoming more robotic than the robots they build to remind themselves of their humanity. 
At the very least, it would give the audience some metaphorical statements to tease out of Scott's images, because we don't need this kind of flab character development, least of all in the second act, when events should be set in motion that directly refer to the ensuing climax. Pardon the pun. I learn a great deal more about a man driving himself and his ship into the heart of an alien spacecraft than I do when he questions a woman about her humanity. I was even more gobsmacked to learn that they'd kept this scene but jettisoned another, more relevant character beat where Yannick expresses concern for Vicar's emotional state after she executes Holloway. Alone in her room, she's trembling and appears to be in pain. Yannick says as much. Looks like you're in pain. Vicar shrugs off the attempt at humanizing her and coolly replies, I burned my hand. That says a lot more about this cold-hearted character than having her engage in a brief and inconsequential tryst with Yannick that goes nowhere and is never mentioned or referred to again, and does nothing to influence the relationship of any character in the movie. Well, if you can't be with the one you love, love the one you with. Now, on to David. Big things have small beginnings. The film is particularly vague on his motivations. Is it madness or malice? Is David working towards a goal or is he insane? Is he trying to chart his own course, a sort of futuristic T.E. Lawrence, or is he just an anarchist? That being said, doesn't everyone want their parents dead? Either one is fine, but leaving hints to suggest both is just needlessly confusing storytelling, especially with everything else going on in this film. Characterization need not come at the expense of plot. Consider the film Lawrence of Arabia. It's a masterclass of developing character through narrative, rather than at the expense of either. Nothing is written. You can have both. During one of Lawrence of Arabia's more adroit moments midway through the film, Lawrence, still grieving at the loss of his friend, and potentially lover, though the film is purposefully vague on the matter, is stopped by the literal barrier of the Suez Canal. The unknown motorcyclist screams across the canal to the unknowable ghost from the desert. Who are you? Lawrence pauses as he asks himself the same question, looking every bit the vacant marble bust we see at his funeral in the opening of the film. Though his body may have made it out of the desert, Lawrence's identity remains lost in the wilderness of his own psychology, one writ large against the backdrop of the political and historical machinations of the British conquest of Arabia. His deathly silence can be read in at least two ways. Orange. Either he doesn't know the answer of who he is, and so he has none to give, or he does, and the sobering realization renders him speechless. Either way, all the aspects of the scene combine, from the visual to the costuming, the cinematography and the dialogue, or lack thereof, to reveal that a bit of Lawrence died in that journey across the desert. The rest of the film uses the same expert synthesis of storytelling techniques to show that Lawrence's journey is as much about him coming to grips with that death as it is knowing for certain the answer to that question of who he is. This reference to Lawrence of Arabia is not to say Scott should simply have copied David Lean, though he would have been better served to have done so, and never mind that he already does with an homage that is never used to its fullest potential. The trick, William Potter, is not minding that it hurts. The trick, William Potter, is not minding that it hurts. The question of David's identity and his search for it is entirely abandoned in favor of rushing along to the action beats. Why not have David's search coincide with the awakening of the engineer? We get a fleeting glimpse when David reacts to the engineer's hand resting on his head, like a child embracing the stern hand of his father. But then, David is never given a chance to come to grips with what that action means for his search. Did he learn anything from his maker's maker trying to destroy him? Does he feel anything for the death of Wayland? Or are we meant to take the moment where he gives a brief farewell to his maker as a sign that David is incapable of feeling anything? Have a good journey, Mr. Wayland. There is nothing. But this answer is a slap in the face to the dynamic and engaging David of the film's beginning, and it's entirely at odds with the David just a few moments later who warns Shaw and in no small way begs her to rescue him. Why does he want to go on living at this point? Who is David? 
This attempt at characterization is not as problematic as some of the others, such as Shaw, since David is only intended as a supporting character. But then, why does the film devote such time to him in the first act? Why is his character the only character who warns a proper introduction in the film? Why do we learn more about David than we do about any other character, Shaw included, if he's not meant as the focus of the film? Why does the film stress the connection between Shaw and David through the very personal act of him watching her dreams, if only to have them act as robotic instruments in the plot to get the sequel started? The problem is not that these character moments exist. The problem is that they are unfinished by the film's conclusion, and they should not have been left for the sequel. The largest problem, then, is the structure of the climax, for here in one room at last are all the major characters of the plot, Wayland, David, Shaw, and an engineer who could complete all their goals in this movie, while Vickers, the prodigal daughter of Wayland, watches on from the Prometheus. Instead of making anything with this exceptional opportunity for drama, the scene ends in two minutes with the engineer killing everybody. Couldn't the scriptwriters have picked an engineer who didn't mind having a quick chat? Compare this to a structurally similar journey, and don't laugh when you hear it, The Wizard of Oz. Shaw is Dorothy, David is Tin Man, Wayland is Scarecrow, and Vickers is the Cowardly Lion. And a whoosh, and a royal growl. Now, imagine if after destroying the witch, which in this movie is finding the map and making the journey all the way to this planet, the characters return to the wizard for their prize, Wait, the boons of the We've hero's journey to us. quote Joseph Campbell, the of the wizard, and rather than the fulfilling the plot of the movie, which allows her. all the characters to realize their goals, and for Dorothy to have that wonderful realization that there's no place like home, the wizard had instead gone on a killing spree, tearing off the Tin Man's head and using it to bludgeon the Scarecrow to death. Then they took my chest out and they threw it over there! While Dorothy escapes the balloon. Can anyone see the problem with this ending? If you can't, Turn the video off. I have no idea how to get through to you. Let's not waste each other's time. You've had plenty of time already. Yeah. This is not a matter of expecting something the film wasn't required to provide. This is not a matter of a rabid fan of the original series wanting answers for every question. These questions have nothing to do with the alien mythos. They are basic and essential script requirements for any film. We can say that this film needed to have an introduction, rising action, climax, and denouement because that's exactly what this film provides. Nor is it a matter of, Scott should have done this, or Lindelof should have written that. They are perfectly within their right to do whatever they want. But just because they do it, doesn't make it the best idea. And for people who argue that any idea is a good one, and there's no relative scale in ideas, that ending The Wizard of Oz with a bloodbath is a more narrative and thematically satisfying film than as it currently stands, once again, turn off this video. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> Vickers and David aren't the only characters whose potential are squandered in this film. A majority of the characters are, but I want to examine the supposedly main character, Dr. Shaw, in more detail. If Shaw feels like an incomplete character in this film, it's because she is. If we're more drawn to David, it's because he's the more compelling character. One problem with this character is that she's not relatable, since the film gives her all but one moment to process the events transpiring. Instead of allowing Shaw to process events in the conclusion, the plot just shuffles on from moment to moment. Shaw becomes an illogical puppet dancing on the strings of the scriptwriters. She performs actions not because they are logical or motivated by character, but because the script demands it. Yet the script also neglects to demand she behave with any sort of logical characteristics. Even after all this, you still believe, don't you? In the case of Shaw, her character exists in the plot as the brilliant scientist who discovers the origins of life. Get the problem with this description is that Shaw doesn't act like a scientist. But how do you know? Hmm? I don't. But it's what I choose to believe. Never mind that most scientists lean closer to Richard Dawkins than Francis Collins about what's going on with God. Shaw constantly distorts and disobeys facts that don't support her initial conclusions. Guess you can take your father's cross off now. 
Why would I want to do that? Because they made us. And who made them? <laughs> While there are scientists like this in real life, they're not being entrusted with multi-billion dollar projects. I think they want us to come and find them. The fact that nobody ever acknowledges it either is a strike against their intelligence as well, especially when it puts their own lives in danger. The most extreme example of this is when they make contact with an alien race for the first time. Rather than responding with fear, trepidation, wonder, awe, anything remotely passing for a normal and logical human reaction, Shaw's immediate response is to simply scream nonsense at it like a crazy banshee. Imagine if you'd been sleeping quite peacefully for 2,000 years and then this screeching harpy wakes you up. I need to know why. What did we do wrong? Why do you hate us? Yeah, I'd try to kill everyone too. The problem is not so much that she responds this way, although there are better ways of displaying a person being wholly consumed by their quest for answers. No. The greater problem is that nobody else responds the way a normal human being would respond. Wayland is merely annoyed that she's speaking first, not that her behavior might startle, alarm, or otherwise make for a bad first encounter with an alien species. Then, he goes into full-out dastardly villain mode when he tells one of the guards to shoot her if she opens her mouth again. Wayland's reaction to Shaw makes him arguably as ridiculous as her. Why did you bring her if you care so little about her? Or, if she's so expendable you're willing to kill her, why didn't you just leave her on the ship when she expressed concern for the mission? You had David. What do you need her there for? More importantly, why wouldn't you have established a game plan for this first contact? We must leave. NASA has countless protocols in place on the off chance they even ever remotely encounter the specter of an alien microbe. And these scientists, when confronted with the startling truth that there is in fact an alien just a mile down the road, don't have the slightest plan. I'm telling you, stay back! Do it. it becomes difficult for the audience to identify with any character left alive in this movie. And not simply because they're all dying off at a rapid pace. Shaw is particularly impenetrable, since the only thing we know about her character is that we have no idea how she's going to behave in any given situation. But not because she's mysterious, but instead because she's the bastard product of at least two scriptwriters, working many months apart, who each need her character to do something for a plot beat. That's fine if the film is more about the search for answers than it is merely whether Shaw lives or dies, but by the end it clearly becomes the latter as the film devolves into merely Shaw's struggle to survive. What artistic impetus drives this movie? Is it to depict a particularly compelling plot, characters, or for some other reason? If it's for plot, why does it remain so unfinished and haphazardly constructed? If it's for the characters, why are they so unrealized? Why leave everything so unfinished? I've already mentioned one film that managed to do both, but I'll conclude with another. Ironically, also starring Numi Rapace. The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, in whichever version you watch, is a self-contained film. By that, I mean that the major narrative arcs of the characters Sweet and of the Harriet. plot are completed. Someone in the family murdered Harriet, and for the past 40 years, that's been trying to drive me insane. Some arcs, such as Elizabeth's relationship with the reporter Michael Bloomkist, carry over into the sequel but a clearly defined beginning, middle, and end of a specific period in their relationship is found in the first episode. So too is the plot as much about the murder mystery as it is the character of the girl with the dragon you tattoo. Help me catch a killer of women. The story has the good sense to conclude at least one of these arcs by the film's end, a lesson which Scott and his writers would have been well advised to consider. Before the adventure begins. If you like where my words are going, Follow them on Twitter at BinaryBastard. For more movie reviews, analysis, and criticism, head on over to my blog.